Once again, we are giving away two of our bespoke Freemasons Without Borders mugs. For a chance to win, please answer the following question. To the nearest 50, how many subscribers do we now have on our YouTube page? Please type your answers in the chat section and always, as always, the first two correct answers will win. Brethren, before I introduce our next speaker, um, I was going through my archives over the weekend and realised that today is our 26th talk of the series, which means we celebrate our half year anniversary today. I would like to offer a heartfelt thanks to all of you who have joined us on this journey, whether that's taking the time out of your business and personal commitments to join us on the live talks or for catching up on them via our YouTube channel. I am truly grateful to all of you for making our weekly talk so successful across the world and look forward to continuing our journey together. So thank you very much from Mahir and myself to all of you, brethren. Mm. Right, without further ado, brethren, please allow me to introduce you to Worshipful Brother Martin Falks. Martin is a London Mason whose mother lodge is Burlington Lodge number 96. He is a memory specialist who has dedicated his life to the disciplines of the mind Today, we are going to hear about the history of the art of memory and how this relates to pure and ancient Freemasonry. When it comes to Masonic learning, Martin is in a very good position to study as he works as general manager of Lewis Masonic, which is the world's oldest Masonic publishing company. Worshipful Brother Martin, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, brethren, it's an honor to be talking for you this evening. The series of informative lectures that I've seen taking place from this particular project have been magnificent. And I think it's doing a lot to keep Freemasonry alive at a very trying time, which is something that has never really occurred in our history. Today, we will be exploring our history. Indeed, I'm going to take you on a journey through memory, both memory of our own Masonic tradition, but also the memory of our own art of remembering as well. Now they say a picture is worth a thousand words and uh, I tend to talk quite passionately on this subject so it's probably good for me to start a slideshow that, so that everyone gets a chance uh, to uh, retire this evening. Wonderful. Now, can everyone see the title of the talk before them? Is it, is it working? Brilliant. Thank yeah, you. we can see it. So, let's start by just taking a few moments to think about the relationship between memory and Freemasonry as we know it now. Us Freemasons, we love we uh, memorize uh, beautiful, inspiring moral plays, uh, which uh, we see as a means of self-improvement, to be more virtuous people, uh, to uh, be better at performing and inspiring others with the same. We pay attention to all the little details. We need to remember where we stand, how we hold and position our bodies, where the different symbolic items within our lodge is positioned, and how it changes throughout the ceremony. But that's not all. We love it, don't we, when the director of ceremonies can remember the names and ranks of everyone visiting or when there's recollection of detail about a guest's lodge or a past event. Actually, memory is very important to us in other ways as well. Freemasons want to commemorate things. We want to make plaques and put them on the wall. We want to put up monuments to things that happen. Someone who gifts something to the lodge puts their name on it. This is a quite common occurrence. So we can remember who it was whose kindness is still 
uh, giving us uh, the blessing of its usage many years later. When a brother passes away, we make sure we recall all the contributions that he's made. And if he was a master of the Lord, his name will be on the wall forever amongst those other luminaries who helped guide uh, that uh, particular unit. If anyone here uh, present or anyone watching YouTube in the future who's a Freemason that doubts uh, how important memory is to Freemasons, just try changing something. Decide that you think that a certain object in the lodge should be somewhere else. Suggest it's more logical. Uh, move things around a bit. Ad lib a bit in your ritual, and you'll soon find how important exact recollection is to us. So to explore what got us to this point of respect and practice of memory, whereby we're probably one of the very few organizations or traditions that are still memorizing uh, verbantum many hours of uh, inspiring soliloquy and uh, ritual, let's go back in our own memory. Let's go to very first hints of speculative Freemasons. Now, just like if any of us here sits and tries to think back to our earliest memories, it gets a bit vague and a bit hard to know exactly what happened. Uh, but we all know where we need to start, don't we? We need to move our location. We need to go to Scotland. So if you're not already there, brethren, it's time to hear the sound of bagpipes call. Uh, make yourself a whiskey and settle down to learn the earliest hints we see of speculative memorization and ritual. So before you, you can see a, a, the countenance of a splendid looking fellow, a William Shaw. Now, William Shaw, there's been a bit of debate as to whether this is a genuine picture of him. It's certainly of his time, and I like to think that it could be true. It really resonates for me, but I've never found the, the source of this illustration, and neither have as Robert Cooper from the Grand Lodge of Scotland. But William Shaw is the figure that we need to focus on. He was a member of the royal court of uh, James the Sixth, uh, to be James the First of, of England. So for those of you who aren't very close to the history of England and Scotland, this is a Scottish king and William Shaw is a member of that royal court. We know that his family became quite close to the royalty by looking after their wine cellars. It's a very good route uh, to uh, affection of powerful people. Um, but as time went on, we see that Shaw had various other duties. At one point, he's recorded as being a watchkeeper, and he certainly arranged repair of watches and clocks in the uh, royal household. Later on, we see that his duties extend a lot further, as you'll hear. Indeed, it could be that we're about to look at the first formation of a Masonic Book of Constitutions. In the centre, you can see a Mason's Mark. Uh, this may be that of Shaw's, or maybe the, the stonemason that made uh, his gravestone. Next to that, you can see a copy of something known as the Shaw Statutes. This is an exciting text for anyone here to know about and learn about. The Shaw Statutes uh, was Shaw's first uh, action after he was appointed the Master of Works. So the king 
put him in charge of the stonemasons in Scotland. Now, Shaw himself was a Catholic, and often the stonemasons were as well. So I wonder if the choice of Shaw was because of this. But there's also a hint that Shaw had trained in stonemasonry for his moral betterment. Uh, so he knew about this art. So uh, just as most of us would do, the first thing he did is draw up a book of rules. So the first one, which is 1598, the Shaw Statutes appears, and it's, it's everything you need to understand about being a stonemason and being a member of a stonemason's lodge. It has rules which are about how you're gonna look after your tools and treat your employers, how you're going to make sure you don't knock other people down on the scaffolding and what you do if someone does do that. It's, it's quite comprehensive. It also puts uh, the Edinburgh Lodge in charge. And that seems to have been a problem because in uh, uh, 1599, we get a reissue. And in that issue, we get um, Mother Kelwinning appears and the Kelwinning Lodge has obviously got a little bit um, concerned about not being mentioned. And now it's, it's the Mother Lodge, but it still gives authority uh, to the Edinburgh Lodge. You, you can see there's a bit of jostling for position here. Now, these sure statutes, they were respected. And you can see they're respected because there were two lodges that even transitioned into speculative, uh, one of which is still going, that have or had their own copies of this. So Atchison's Haven Lodge actually had a copy of the Shaw Statutes amongst their minute books, which go back 400 years. Imagine that, a lodge which was speculative, but went back to being stonemasons, and it used these statutes as their rule book. Now they respected this rule book, uh, but just as modern Scottish lodges are independent and keep their own traditions, they didn't respect it too much, uh, in the sense that they were willing to cross out rules and write in their own as well. Now the other lodge, which is still going, St Mary's Chapel, this, this actually also has a copy of this. So we know that these rules came uh, uh, along with the tradition. Now the first part of the second issue of the Shaw Statutes, that's, that's to do with all the stonemasonry rules. But the second, that's about being a member of the lodge. And we start to see some really interesting things. We can see that when you join, you buy gloves for everyone in the lodge. Oh, we can see that you're put into an entering book and you're passed to be a member. But we can also see there's some form of practice that we might see as ritual taking place. You can see this particular point from the second Shaw Statutes says that the wardens of the lodge and the other members, according to their uh, vocation, whether they're fellow craft or apprentice, they're going to have to practice the art of memory. And they will pay penalty if they make a mistake. So masters of the uh, various lodges, uh, take note, you've got a historical justification going back to the 16th century to find people if they get their ritual wrong. So this is very interesting. If we look at the context, they actually are saying that you need a, a kind of proposer and a seconder who've got good memory to train you up. That's sort of part of uh, this practice. And this isn't about memorization of stonemason techniques. This is something about membership, being a member, so you can answer questions and, and uh, that, that kind of thing. Now, the really exciting bit here is that particular phrase, the art of memory. If you and I get all the publications which uh, were uh, 
produced between 1500 and 1600 that mention that art of memory, or but two, when they use that phrase art of memory, they don't mean memorization, they mean a very special art, a particular technique which has been handed down uh, since antiquity to uh, aid you to have a better memory and also to bring around uh, certain improvements to your mind. This memory art is one that uses a building as a filing system. So the practice involves choosing a building real or imaginary and in your mind's eye walking around that building and you'll practice using all your senses you will feel your feet on the floor you will feel your body moving you will have the scent of the place other is there a wooden floor is the incense if it's a holy place is it your home can you can you smell cooking you will have touch, you will open the doors, you will feel uh, the breeze on your skin, you will see clearly with a great imagination what is there. During your tour, you will stop at set, set places, certain places which are prearranged, which are interesting. So if it's your house, it's a really good thing to use your house as a memory palace, you will stop at the front door. That will be your location number one. You will walk through, there'll be your, the, where you hang your coats, location number two. You carry on through, uh, maybe you go into your living room, there's the couch, location number three. Uh, maybe that you've got a television there or a fireplace. Let's say television, location number four. And you'll do this throughout your whole house. So you've got 30 to 60 locations. Once you've got this route, your, your pilgrimage through your house set, so you can just do it without uh, any form of effort. You can just be there and you'll be surprised how easy this is if it's a place you visit often. Then you've got a new filing system. So what you do is if you want to remember something, you put it in that filing system and you use images which are really memorable to make them stick. So the, by memorable, it's gonna be anything that's emotive. It could be horrific, it could be funny, it could be silly, it could be shocking. So if someone wants you to memorize uh, a list of people's names for a speech, you will turn each one of their names into a, a, a an image which is easy to go back to. If they're named Smith, you could imagine Jack, uh, a uh, blacksmith. So you imagine you walk up to your front door and you're trying to operate the knocker, but there's a, it's heated red hot and it's already knocking because there's a blacksmith hitting it. Very shocking image, very confusing image there, but you're gonna remember it. When you go into the room and you look up there, you can imagine uh, where the, you should be hanging your coat, that there's um, a barrel there. And there's a man in the barrel, he's got no clothes on, he's asking you to get something down from the coat. Mr. Cooper, because Mr. Cooper makes barrels. As you walk in, sitting on your couch, you could, you'd have your next figure. Uh, maybe uh, it's Mr. Michelle, but you can imagine some holding shells. Uh, and he's saying, don't take away me shells. So you've got your silly image there. This way, when it comes to the list, you just walk through the memory palace again. Now this is a very basic use of it, but this art allowed people to achieve a huge degree of perfection. Uh, they could remember things in an almost superhuman way. But what's this got to do with stonemasons? Well, you can imagine stonemasons would probably be very good at forming memory palaces. But this is something special that you need to remember to advance through the stonemasons lodge. 
Is he talking about Masonic ritual? It would seem to make sense. You see, our ritual does take place in a building, an imaginary building. They didn't have lodge rooms uh, back in 16th century Scotland like we have. It was in your imagination. In fact, we know that even as late as the mid 1700s, they were painting uh, symbols on the floor to aid your imagination. They were using chalk. Likewise, if we look at our rituals, we do walk round in a set pattern. We stop at set locations. And there are symbols in those set locations, things for us to remember. So this ties together so well that it's made many people contemplate what it could mean. Is it that if you're sure when you're drawing up your constitutions, you don't want to put secret initiation ceremonies. I mean, you're Catholic and if you're in a country and it's a bit uncomfortable anyway, maybe it's a tactful way of describing Masonic ritual. Or maybe that's what they viewed Masonic ritual as. Was it memory for them? Now, here's where it gets very interesting. If Masonic ritual in 16th century uh, Scotland actually is seen as a form of the art of memory or is somehow connected, even if it's how he describes it to the art of memory, what form of memory is it? You see, this special art had different schools. So just like if someone said to you, he studies martial arts, it could mean boxing or judo or, or whatever, or he studies music, what is it, piano, what is it, you know, uh, a violin. Memory, the art of memory could mean different schools. And there were three which were very popular and well known in Scotland. And this is a very important thing for those who perhaps uh, are unaware that educational level in Scotland in those days, and as time went on and the Renaissance uh, started to go into full force, it, it, was, it was amazing what they were doing. Um, we hear a lot about uh, James uh, the first or James the sixth, depending on where you are. Uh, don't be mistaken by anything negative you hear. This man was a polymath who was very well educated and supported people. He had his own alchemical laboratory. He was having lessons in different arts. He was a real champion of the development of the mind. So the three different schools that we know were in his royal court are as follows. The classical art of memory which would be from ancient Greece and through um, Rome. And this was for speech making. The Christian art of memory, a new adaption of that art that came after Rome fell, which was a memory art, which was designed to cultivate virtue to lead to salvation. Or the mystical, ambitious, hermetic art of memory, a special technique uh, that claimed that you could lead your consciousness to a higher form of enlightenment and evolution beyond that of being a normal man. All three were present. There was a man called James Fowler, he was teaching the king the art of memory, and his writings do appear to be of the classical school, though I do know he was also educated in hermetic art. He was exchanging uh, memory lessons for lessons in poetry from the king. Imagine that. Um, we know the Christian art of memory was very powerful in Scotland at the time. Uh, Driver Abbey, were, and Kelwinning were centres whereby they were reproducing beautiful memory documents and distributing them. And they had many Christian memory masters there. Would it not be natural uh, for the stonemasons to have learnt the art of Christian memory from their employers? After all, any monk 
any priest, any nun of the day, would be practicing this art as part of their duties. And finally, the heretic Giordano Bruno, he had come over to England. He demonstrated superhuman feats of memory, being able to photographically recall anything he'd ever seen. His memory was so powerful and distinct, it was said he could observe more than most people and maybe even remember the future. He had developed his own particular mystical school of memory, and he had taken an apprentice, a man called Alexander Dixon, a friend of William Shaw, who attended the royal court. Dixon became famous in his own right and wrote his own books on the art of hermetic memory, so much so that in Scotland, the art of memory became known as Dixon's art uh, for many years afterwards. All three of these influences are there. And historians and enthusiasts have speculated as to which one of them influenced our rituals, which one of them can we see is in it. Well, today we're going to attempt to solve that not by looking for any new evidence, but by a analysis of each one of these techniques so that we can see which matches most what has been handed to us. So now, unfortunately, brethren, it's time to leave Mother Scotland and we need to go further back in time. Take off your kilts and don your togas. Replace your whiskey with wine. We're going to ancient Greece. Now, the classical art of memory. The first mention of this beautiful practice is in a work known as Isui Logai, Opposing Opinions. This is a very strange text indeed. It's dated about 450 years BC. And it's a text which is almost a parody of the sophists at the time. I, I read it and I can, I can hear the authors laughing at me because I don't know whether it's serious or not. This so I know, guys, when you deliberately engage with the opposite argument, but this one is taking it to the extreme. It's almost like a reductor ad absurdum. You can, you can tell I've, I study these things a bit, can't you? But the, the most important thing is we have in this text a section that describes the technique I mentioned to you. Get yourself a building, and put in locations, and put in exciting images as a means to remember. We have a little hint in there that what you remember might be able to change who you are. This hint is something that you'll see grow later on. Now it's interesting when this occurs because the legend of the invention of the art of memory is uh, from a man who was around almost the same time, Somandes of Hios. Now, Somandes was a lyric poet of the day at a time where the Greek peoples were still divided into different Ionic or Athenian groups and they, their Hellenic uh, units worked together as allies, but not as one unified empire. This man, he was a rock star of the day. His uh, beautiful poems were really sought after. And just as nowadays we get very excited over rock stars, you can see in the ancient times we get so excited over poets and musicians, they tend to get legends told about them for many years later. Well, in this case, the story goes that Somandes was hired. He was hired to give a beautiful poetic speech at an event of a tyrant at the time. I, I believe his name was Scopas. And Scopas, he, he hired him to impress everyone, a bit like 
if one of us hired Mick Jagger to perform at our birthday party, it might impress the guests there. And when Sir Mandy's came to perform, they were suitably impressed. As he stood up, he dedicated his poem uh, both to the twin stars Castor and Pollux, that's Gemini to you and me, and uh, to his host as well. And he performed the most magnificent and beautiful speech. It was done with a sense of rhythm and rhyme. It was witty, it was clever. It showed his awareness of the audience. Everyone was impressed. It was almost as if the host had turned them on mute. But the host himself was not impressed. And he remarked uh, to, the, uh, to Sir Mandy's, as you have only dedicated half this to me, I will only pay you half. If you want the rest of your fee, let those two stars come down and pay you it. Well, Sir Mandy's didn't have time to be upset, uh, for a messenger appeared telling him that two young boys were to see him at the door. Oh my word, how, how interesting. When he went there, there was no one to be seen. Uh, but behind him, to his surprise, there was a crash as the whole of the building fell down and everyone was crushed to death. Host, guests, everything. Maybe the stars had paid their half of the fee, but there were greater gifts to appear. When he went back and had a look, everyone was so crushed that their bodies couldn't be identified and it became necessary to try to help the uh, families who are mourning that loss. He found his surprise that he could remember where everyone in this whole place was by their location, by what they were eating, by what they're, who they're sitting next to. The first memory palace was invented. He discovered that our mind works best on location and association. Now we don't know if this is a, a true story because it could be said that it's a bit suspicious uh, that it's so memorable. Do you remember all the different things I was telling you about? They're, the locations, so they're, they're in the, the uh, different places, there's horror there, there's reward. It's just a bit suspicious that this can be remembered so easily. Uh, you can see in the picture that the the, the twins do actually appear to help him here, but in the, in the story, there's no one to be found. But also Castor and Pollux, twins, that's a very good symbol for memory. So this is probably a memory story uh, to help you keep the principles of the art of memory in your mind. As time went on though, this memory art became very popular and perfected. It was a utilitarian art, an art for people who were solicitors, who were public speakers, who were barristers. It was something that people could use in order to file away information they would need. And for this reason, the recommendations were always that you would use a physical location which you could access. Oh, you seem to started going back through our, through our slides at high speed. Um, let me see if I can reverse that process as we, as we carry on. So you would go to somewhere, the instructions were very clear, where you could walk around in quiet without being disturbed, whereby you would be able to make locations, yes, this is where it meant to be, make locations which were not too far apart, not too close together, where that memory palace wasn't too light and wasn't too dark. You don't want your eyes dazzled when you're putting this palace in your mind. 
Using this method, people could do amazing things. They would normally use somewhere with lots of pillars or a house that they visited a lot or um, a public place, uh, like a, a Parthenon style place. Um, and they would build up memory images. So if they wanted to remember a court case, they would picture the person and they put objects on them, which would be a, a joke, a play on words that would allow them to remember things about them. They normally make them stand on a symbol that represented where they came from. So if they came from a place with a famous building, they'd be standing on that famous building. They, if they were stabbed to death, they'd be holding the knife in their heart. If their name was uh, Mr. Rabbit, uh, they would have rabbit's ears. It would be an image built up with the dates and the exact rules uh, that um, events that went uh, in that court case in place. You could use this for complete biographies. You could use this for all sorts of things. We know that at the time there were memory practitioners, centurions that could remember the name and the birthplace of all the people under their command. Poets like Samandis, who would be able to go to a village, memorize all the names of everyone, and then go back two years later and show they still had this. There were people that could recite the Iliad forwards as well as backwards, word for word. By the time we get to Rome, there are manuals, beautiful manuals, and this is seen as part of the rhetorical art. At the time, words are your thoughts made manifest. So you're improving yourself when you learn to be eloquent or when you learn to be restrained, when you learn to be logical, logos, uh, voice, you're learning to think and speak at the same time. The word uh, topic is the Greek word for location, because if you had a speech uh, performed such as this one, you'd have set locations in a memory palace. Where you'd walk up to the door and you'd have your first subject. You'd walk up to the coat hangers and you'd have the second and so on. You'd have triggers as you went through. And so much was this part of speaking that it became part of our language now. You also see this memory art used the opposite way. So if I want to make something memorable for you, I need to use locations. Every time I change subject, I need to create a beautiful, different place for you to place it in, in your mind. You read the works of Plato, you'll see Socrates always walks somewhere else when he wants to talk about something else. He's going to tell you about goodness in the city. He's going to walk to sit under a tree near a stream to tell you about beauty. Uh, this is the way. Likewise, through repetition, you can lead someone into certain views on things through the art of memory. If you're a politician, take people through the decision you want them to make emotionally in small ways, in the same way again and again and again. Uh, walk them through the route to where you want to take them. We have some texts uh, which remain that describe the rules I mentioned to you. Rhetorica ad herenium, rhetoric for Henry. We don't remember who it was that actually wrote this. It was definitely for someone called Henry, uh, we thought for many years it was by Cicero uh, in the medieval times, it's thought to be by Cicero. Uh, we, Cicero himself does write about the art of memory, but he doesn't give the lovely explanations that Ad Herenium does. We also have writings on memory and recollection by Aristotle. This doesn't give us a huge amount on this. We do discover that Aristotle used to recommend his students memorize all the arguments that could be against what they were going to uh, say. And he does talk about memory a lot. But as time goes on, you'll see that these texts, they get built on, misinterpreted, reinterpreted, and uh, really emphasized uh, as part of our path. So, Rome didn't last forever. And as it fell, we lost a lot. From its ashes, 
memory rose again. Because, of course, memory is made to be memorable. Indeed, um, around uh, the fall of Rome, we see the first uh, saint of memory appear, Saint Augustine, who he said that through memory, he could find God. In the spacious fields and palaces of memory, where are you? For him, God was the only thing that he could find that he couldn't remember having experienced any other way. It was pure mind finding mind. But to fully understand what this art became, as it moved from the rhetorical training of, of Augustine into a fully developed, beautiful practice, we need to go a bit further forwards. As our togas are removed, we get to don the uniform of a knight, for we're going to medieval Europe to visit the perfection of Christian memory. An art which would span for a very long time and is still practiced in many places today. Do you remember those instructions I gave you for how you would form a memory in the classical art? Well, they became Christianized through, through bad translation, but also through translation uh, which was hopeful and directed in a certain direction. So, that instruction to make sure uh, that your, the light wasn't too bright and wasn't too dark became to sit in solemn darkness. The instruction saying that you need to find a place which is very quiet became go on retreat into a place of solitude. The make those images exciting, shocking, rude, scary became cleave holy images to your heart with great passion and endeavour. You see, what had happened was the Christian masters of memory started uh, to interpret the memory arts in a way which would allow them to walk the narrow path. They saw these beautiful scriptures and they felt that the closer they could get to them, the more they could be within their consciousness, uh, the uh, better chance they had of following its precepts. And indeed, uh, we see within the Bible, I think it's in Corinthians actually, we see a section where you are told that you are to be like a master builder. You are to make yourself a, a, like a building inside. Uh, it, and uh, a res to make yourself fit to uh, have the Spirit of God enter you. They read this and they took this literally. This art of building in yourself was most certainly what the Bible was talking about. They were going to fill themselves full of images of virtue and of holiness. And gone were the utilitarian buildings, in were biblical buildings. Now, if you read the works of Hugh of St. Victor, uh, and it's important to know that Hugh of St. Victor, during the very early medieval times, he was very popular in uh, Scotland. Richard of St. Victor was actually a Scots. He wrote a lovely manual called The Little Book of Noah's Ark, where he describes that you must be like a master mason, where you are going to, there's a rough stone, which is your personality, you're going to make it smooth. And he describes how you would make a memory palace uh, of Noah's Ark. And if you can't paint in your mind very well, if you can't visualize, don't worry, you can draw it in chalk on the floor to begin with. And the idea is to put images in your mind and the images were believed to be able to change you. And this is a very important thing to get absolutely clear from this moment onwards. There was a unquestioning belief that whatever you memorized became you. So 
If you were uh, a uh, cheating husband, your priest may give you a, a poem to memorize, which would be about being faithful. If you were an old lady suffer from anxiety, you would be shown a stained glass window or a picture which had scenes which were calming from the Bible. And you'd be taught meditatio pneumonica, uh, memory meditation. And you would contemplate these different images to become calm and tranquil. It kind of works, you know, you're going from the, um, a lamb uh, lying down with the, uh, the lion all the way through uh, to uh, Gabriel, declaring what was going that Jesus was coming these beautiful scenes of hope salvation and tranquility your mind will be on them you'd have to memorize a poem to go with each picture so you couldn't you couldn't feel anxious for a while it was perfect meditatio perfect meditation the different memory palaces we see at this time are really quite exciting in front of us you can see that is Noah's Ark the image there with the two angels, and we can see there that that is actually a depiction of the ark. And each symbol there has so much detail. Each animal has a virtue. And this was very connected. There was a practice in, in very in the medieval times where they would have what they call a bestiary. A bestiary was a, a book of exciting animals from whales and tigers, and each one would have a Christian virtue and memorize. Some of those animals weren't real. They were made up, uh, things like the bonicon. Uh, the bonicon is uh, an animal that can defend itself uh, from, but because it can fire fire out of its rear end. And uh, they had all sorts of these fantastic animals, but they and people nowadays think, wow, did the medieval people believe these were true? No, they didn't. Uh, that it was, it was them making it memorable. And even the animals we do recognize are made very memorable. Panthers, they give off a beautiful scent that, allow, that uh, charms other animals, and there's unicorns and elephants and moles and all sorts of things. They're beautiful uh, books for your memory. This was the expert version where you've got these animals that have gone into Noah's Ark. Here you can see uh, the book of uh, the Seraphim badly translated when it came to England, into cherubim, but let's not worry too much. This is a lovely memory palace, lovely manual. This is a mystical meditation whereby each and every one of these feathers, it's one of the paths of your salvation. You will contemplate on it deeply. You will imagine the angel before you. You will contemplate all these symbols of virtue until you connect. You will go from, uh, a meditatio to contemplatio, which is oneness, and then finally to extatio. Anyone here who's trained in Buddhism or yoga will see this is this is Christian samyama. This is Christian meditation leading to samadhi. Um, well, apologies for interrupting you. Um, we we do need to wrap this up. We need to be done by seven o'clock, and we've got some questions to ask as well. Oh, wonderful! Let me let me fast forward then as much as I can. Thank you. So we can see here, there's also the, uh, the other symbols that you have of the time. A very good memory palace, the breastplate of Aaron. Uh, the, uh, you could see the uh, coat of many colours. And here is one of the most popular at the time of all. Going through the levels of hell, purgatory and heaven. So hell you'd go through remembering all the things you shouldn't do. Purgatory, you go through doing all the things that you need to do to make things back up. And heaven, you'd go through uh, making sure that you remember all the things you should do and seeing the rewards, the rewards which would uh, allow you to stay motivated. This became a very serious practice uh, in most orders. And if anyone's here has read Dante's Inferno, you'll be well aware of uh, what uh, the, the kind of level of imagery they were using was. But of course, the most popular would be Solomon's Temple and the Tabernacle. This was the first uh, stone building in the Bible. You can imagine 
why this could have become a focus of Masonic contemplation. Uh, people talk about the Tower of Babel, that was brick. No shoddy workmanship for the stonemasons in Scotland. Uh, so they moved on to Solomon's Temple, uh, made of stone, uh, very, very good. But how did it work? Where did uh, this art connect with self-improvement? Well, St. Uh, Thomas Aquinas and his teacher, Albert the Great, uh, they had uh, both uh, really studied this and they sussed it out. If you really memorized the uh, image or the lesson, they believed that like when you were bitten by a wolf, it would put it into your, into your estimative ability. That was the word for the subconscious. You would subconsciously learn that. So this was the way that you would do this. And he said that uh, um, what the quote, the exact quote is, uh, vows of fidelity and virtue slip easily from the mind of men if not associated with a corporeal solimitude. So that would mean uh, that you need to put an image with anything you want to learn from you want to keep in your mind. They've read in Aristotle, you can't think without an image. So we were taught to put virtuous images in your mind. So here are the main characteristics of the Christian art of memory. A focus on virtue, a love of corporeal solimitudes, and the use of biblical images. The idea that you can connect with an image and make it part of yourself. Emblem books were produced, books that look just like tracing boards, which would allow you to cultivate specific qualities within yourself. So this concludes the, the, the talk on the Christian art of memory, and you can see how this evolved naturally from the uh, the classical. Now, um, you said we need to um, w wind up about seven. Is that about? It's about seven now, is it not? It is. That's right. We uh, we've got some questions to go through, and then we. Uh, we so, uh, brethren, you've heard about the development up until the point uh, where we get to see the shore statutes. If you wish to learn about the hermetic art of memory, you're going to need to invite me back. Martin, thank you ever so much. Fantastic. Um, although I think I'll have to watch it back on YouTube to remember everything you've said. <laughs> but some some great tips and great pointers there. Um, if we could go on to questions, brother Philip. Philip, how are you? Hello, me doing well. Thank you. What about you? Okay. Um, so uh, yeah, hello, brother Martin, and thank you for the brilliant speech as always. Uh, You've mentioned that the memory palace technique could also be considered as a spiritual or maybe even a mystical practice. I wonder how would you compare it to meditation? Because in the memory palace technique, you use your concentration to go through the palace and think intensively. Yet in the meditation, you should be only observing your mind without fully engaging with it. So. Would you say there are any similarities between both techniques or there is something that, that I'm missing? And could we consider the memory palace as a form of meditation? Thank you. Yes, certainly. Uh, so meditation, uh, we can see, is defined as having your mind rested on one specific thing. We can see uh, this in many different traditions. The Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, of course, a list that you can focus on a particular mantra, uh, uh, your, the pushing out of a breath, a, uh, a vision of someone who is very austere. There are many different ways you can choose to keep your mind centered on one particular place. We also see in traditions, uh, certain meditations, which are, are a series of different uh, contemplations on the very same subject. And that is very much what a memory palace became and indeed becomes as the story that I've been telling you 
continues. So the idea that if you want to contemplate truth, you could have a series of different contemplations on that theme in order to fully tune in to that essence of truth was very much part of the art of memory. Uh, you can see similar style practices in certain uh, tantric and uh, Buddhist uh, techniques, whereby they deliberately just change focus a little bit through, through their whole meditation. Uh, so in this sense, the same states and the same uh, progression of the consciousness uh, continues uh, in, the, in memory arts as we would see in formal meditation. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, Philip, as always. Martin, I think we're going to have to take you up on that. I think you and I will have to work on uh, getting you back on um, to go through the hermetic art of memory. Uh, I can see a lot of messages on there already asking for it. So it was definitely something, brother, that we, Martin and I will be speaking about and we will certainly bring to you. Um, thank you very much, all of you, again, for listening to our talk today. Really, truly appreciated. Um, we're delighted to announce that next week um, we will be uh, our talk will be given uh, by the recently appointed first Grand Master Mason Paul Mycock, who is the first Grand Master Mason of the Worship for Society of Freemasons, or better known to us as the Operatives. Same time, same place, brethren. Six p.m. The talk will start next week. Um, I wish you all um, a safe evening. A blessed evening and we shall see you all again next week. Thank you ever so much, everyone. Peace to all. Thank you.